All right, welcome everybody. Erev Tov, part two. We're in this, uh, what should be, uh, is a fascinating series, how Tanakh was put together. Just before we start, of course, um, next week with the change in time, I'll, I'll send it up, but just to announce, um, Monday, Tuesday, our classes are going to Eastern time. In other words, 11 and uh, 11 a.m. as they normally are. And Wednesday, Thursday, Rev Carmel and Shuli Mishkin will be doing Israel time. So the shirm will move up just for next week for one That's hour. Good. So um, Rav Carmel will be at 2.15 Eastern time and Shuli will be at 1 p.m. Just to let you know, because next week uh, Israel changes the clock on Saturday night and we don't change it till the following week. Anyways, let's learn about Tanakh and it's a pleasure to see everybody. And Dr. Sokolow, time to learn. So you want to sit here? Okay. Um, so uh, just to... Uh, either remind, uh, both remind those who were with us last week and uh, perhaps just a brief uh, summary for those who might not have been with us. Uh, the you principal areas- You want to the invitation? The principal areas that we're going to cover uh, in the evolution of Tanakh are authorship, that is who are regarded traditionally and then we'll get to uh, later on, uh, uh, academically, as being the authors of the constituent books of Tanakh. Canonization means who took these 24 individual works of early Jewish literature uh, and proclaimed that they are holy, that they are Kitve Kodesh. Uh, Masoretic text involves everything from how texts of the Bible came uh, from uh, two stone tablets to printed books. Um, and uh, the section on interpretation covers uh, both translations and commentaries. Last week, uh, we started with the subject of authorship with which we will continue this evening. And just to remind you what to put uh, just uh, up on the screen again, what are the 24 constituent books of Tanakh? And while we have them up there, uh, last week, somebody put into the chat a question about why or whether it was in fact proper to continue to refer to these books by their so-called English names instead of their uh, Jewish names. And the curious thing is that if you take a look, what you're seeing in front of you are actually more authentically Jewish than the names by which many of these books are actually known. For example, the first book of the Torah, we call it Bereshit. Now it just happens to be that the word Bereshit doesn't only mean, isn't only the first word in the book, but it also in a sense conveys the essence of the book that it is a book about origins, about beginnings. That's exactly what the word Genesis, which of course is originally a Greek word, what the word Genesis means. Um, if we take a look at the second book, however, in Hebrew, we refer to it as Sefer Shemot. First of all, to be punctilious, we should refer to it as Sefer Ve'ele Shemot, since the very first word in the book is not Shemot, the first word in the book is actually Ve'ele. Problem is that the word Ele is actually the first word in the fifth book of the Torah, in the book of Devarim. And indeed, in early rabbinic literature, the second book of the Torah was called Ve'ele Shemot, and the fifth book of the Torah was called Ve'e or Ele Devarim, uh, Hadavarim. But nonetheless, the name that you see in front of you, which again is Greek in origin, Exodus, is a more authentic uh, name for the second book of the Torah because names really not the, the essence of that book, the essence of that book is in fact the Exodus from Egypt. The third book of the Torah, Leviticus, is in fact the name by which the book was known in rabbinic literature. In rabbinic literature, the third book of the Torah is invariably called Torah Kohanim. Leviticus, in essence, in this case, is synonymous with Kohanim because as we know, the Kohanim are from the, the tribe of Levi. The fourth book of the Torah, we call it Sefer B'midbar. Um, 
And that's really true of four of the five books of the Torah. Since beginning with Sefer Shemot and concluding only with the very end of Devarim, all of them were revealed to Moses in the desert or in the wilderness, okay? The name numbers actually in the original Greek was called arithmoi. And it reflects the fact that in the Mishnah, it's called Chumash HaPikudim, the book of the census, because the census of the Jewish people in the wilderness is delivered, is rendered to us not only once, but in fact several times in this book, in the fourth book of the Torah. And finally, the fifth book of the Torah, Deuteronomy, right? Uh, you may remember from your high school uh, 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 chemistry, Deutero, the prefix Deutero means two. The, uh, the word nomos in Greek means law. For example, if you're self-ruling, you're autonomous, okay? If you're ruled by something outside of yourself, you're heteronomous. Deutero nomos means the second law which is exactly what the book is called in rabbinic literature. It's called Mishneh Torah. So in essence, in the five English, which are really Greek names of the books of the Torah, we have, as I said, even more authentic Jewish names than the names by which we call them. So you might ask, so why is it that we call them Breshit Shemot Vayikra B'midbar Devarim? Why don't we call them Sefer HaYitzira, uh, Sefer Yitziat Mitzrayim. Why don't we refer to Vayikra as Torah Kohanim, etc.? I would suggest that the answer probably is that the names that we call them are kind of like um, they're they're in terms of endearment, meaning because we complete a cycle of Torah reading every year the contents of the books are so familiar to us that we no longer need to refer to them by their official names. We refer to them as it were by the names that they are known by in the family, since we started off by talking about families. So in the family, the first book of the, of the first Chumash is Breshit. We all know that the content of Breshit is the subject of origins, right? So we don't have to refer to it as Sefer HaYetzirah but we can refer to it instead, as I said, by a more insider name. So in any event, that is a, a bit of a, a longer answer than I gave last week. This is essentially a chart of the distribution of the authorship of the 24 books of Tanakh, according to the Talmud. We started with the Gemara and Masachet Bava Batra, starting on Daf Yod Dalet Amud Bet, and continuing through Daf Tet Vav Amud Aleph. And essentially, as I said, this is the distribution of authorship. Moshe Rabbeinu is regarded as the author of his own book. And indeed, it's referred to throughout Tanakh as Sefer Torat Moshe, as though in fact it were his own book. Right? And we spoke at some length about the uh, about the traditional Jewish view of mosaic authorship. And we saw that within the Jewish tradition, there is room to accommodate post-mosaic authorship. But also attributed to Moshe are the parasha of Bil'am and the book of Eov. We'll talk about them this evening. Yoshua, Moses' disciple, is credited with his own book. That would be the book that we call Sefer Yehoshua as well as eight verses, probably the last eight verses, in the Torah itself. The prophet Samuel, Shemuel, is credited with his own book. That would be Sefer Shemuel. In our printed Tanachim, as I already uh, referred to it last week, they appear as two separate books, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, but just like the book of Malachim and later the book of Divrei Hayamim, and for that matter, even the book of Ezra, in the Middle Ages, non-Jews decided for whatever reasons they had to divide these books in half. And that is how the one book, the whole book of Shemuel became Shemuel Aleph and Shemuel Bet. In addition to his own book, 
He is also credited with the authorship of the book of Judges, Shofetim, and of the book of Rut. And we'll talk about that too this evening. King David is credited with the book of Tehillim. And we'll speak about that this evening as well. The prophet Yirmiyahu is credited with his own book, that would be the book that bears his name, as well as the book of Malachim, Kings, and the book that we call Echa, and which the Gemara, as we already saw last week, calls Kinot, Lamentations. Chizkiyahu and his entourage are credited with the books of Yeshayahu, Mishlei, Shir Hashirim, and Kohelet. The Anshe Knesset Hagdola, the men of the Great Assembly, are credited with the books of Yechezkel, the anthology of 12 minor prophets, remembering, as we pointed out last week, but the word minor refers not to their significance, but to their size, right? Uh, as well as the books of Daniel um, and what the, uh, what the uh, Gemara interestingly calls the Scroll of Esther. Now that's interesting because nowadays we think of five books as being scrolls, okay? If I go back for a moment to the preceding uh, slide, you see here, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, right? Shira Shirim, Rot, Echa, Kohelet, and Esther. It is our uh, habit to refer to all of them as Migilot, as scrolls. But interestingly, and we'll elaborate on this later on in the term, so to speak, the Gemara refers only to the book of Esther, specifically as a scroll. That doesn't mean that it is the only one of the 24 books of the Bible that was written on the scroll, as though somehow the other 23 books were written differently. Originally, all of the books of the Bible were written on scrolls. Therefore, the fact that the book of Esther is singularly called a scroll and none of the other 23 books is so called is certainly something that we're going to have to address. Ezra is credited with the authorship of his own book. And as we pointed out, that would be what we today call both the, the combined books of Ezra and Nehemiah, as well as the authorship of that portion of the book of Chronicles that covers everything up to Ezra's own lifetime. But of course, the book of Ezra, the book of Chronicles goes a bit beyond the lifetime of Ezra. And therefore the Talmud asks, who completed the book of Ezra? And the answer is, and therefore he would be designated as the last of the authors of biblical books. His partner, so to speak, Nehemiah, is credited with the balance of the book of Chronicles. So we spoke last week about the statement in the Talmud that Moses wrote his own book. We're going to speak this evening about the balance of that statement that credits him with something called the portion or the section, the parasha of Bil'am and his authorship of Eov. Let's start first with the book of Eov. Happens to be a grand disagreement, machloket, amongst the uh, sages as to when uh, Eov lived. In fact, as we'll see in just a moment, there's even an opinion amongst the sages that Eov never lived, that is to say that he was not an historical character, but that he was entirely a literary character. But even amongst those sages who believe that he was an historical character, they are divided 10 ways as to when the historical Eov might have lived. And as you see, the principal opinion, the first one that's mentioned here, is the opinion of Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, who said that Eov was a contemporary of Moses. Obviously, if Moses is credited with the authorship of the book of Eov, then of course, theoretically, Eov could have lived in Moses' own lifetime. Eov could have lived earlier than Moses, the only thing that this would rule out is the idea that somehow Eov lived after Moses, because if Eov lived after Moses, then arguably, how could Moses have written the book of Eov? 
Nevertheless, we're going to see that there are several opinions amongst the rabbis that actually try to situate Eov historically in an era later than Moses, which of course would raise the question according to those rabbis, who if not Moses was the author of the book of Eov. Let's just simply run through the different opinions. Rabbah said that Eov was during the time of the spies. Those would be the spies that Moses sent into the land of Israel. You may recall that one of the tasks that Moses set for them, he said to them, Hayesh ba Eitz, is there in the land of Canaan a tree? And the traditional interpretation is that he wasn't interested in the, uh, in the uh, flora uh, of the land of Israel, but the word Eitz was a metaphor for a just and righteous person in whose shade, so to speak, the people of Canaan could take uh, uh, could, could live, uh, and therefore they would be impregnable to attack. And the discussion is, well, who could that be? So there's a play on the word eights. Eov came from a, uh, at least uh, arguably, if he was historical, came from a place called Utz. And the similar uh, sound between the word eights and the word Utz uh, led to this idea that what Moses was asking was whether in the land of Canaan there was some worthy person whose uh, merit might protect the Canaanites against the Israelites. And therefore, the answer is yes, there was somebody named Eov who was a righteous man and could theoretically have protected the Canaanites from the Israelites. Rabbi Yochan and Rabbi Eliezer both said that Eo was amongst those who returned from the Babylonian exile and that he had a house of study, a Beit Midrash, in the city of Tiberias. Now, I don't really know how literally to take this. First of all, it would make Eo not only later than Moses, it would make him later than just about every other book of the Bible. The other thing is that if you stop to think about it, the city of Tiberias was named for the Roman emperor Tiberius, who wasn't yet alive at the time that Jews returned to the land of Israel from the Babylonian exile. So Eov, even if he had returned to Israel from the Babylonian exile, could hardly have set up a Beit Midrash in the city of Tiberias. Unless, of course, he set it up in the place which later came to be called Tiberius. But I'm just trying to suggest that this may be a more fanciful opinion than factual. Rabbi Eliezer said that Eov lived during the time of Shafot HaShofetim. That would be the time of the Book of Ruth, the time in which there were people who were judging their judges. And this might just be a way of hinting at the substance of the book of Eov, in which Eov's friends were challenging Eov's claim to righteousness. So in a sense, they were sitting in judgment of him. Rabbi Yoshua ben Korcha said that Eov was during the time of King Achash Rosh. Why? Because at the very end of the book of Job, it describes his daughters as the most beautiful women in the land. Where else do we have reference to the most beautiful women in the land? during the time of Ahasuerus, who staged, as far as we know, the world's first beauty pageant. But then, of course, the Talmud says, wait a second, there was an earlier beauty pageant, and that was conducted at the end of the lifetime of King David when they were trying to find a consort for him. So perhaps they suggest that Eov lived during the time of King David. Rabbi Natan said that Eov lived during the time of the Queen of Sheba. That would be during the time of the reign of Solomon. The sages, right, the just other sages said that he was during the time of the Chaldeans. Hard to say they were Chaldeans over a reasonably long stretch of time, probably referring to the Chaldeans, the Kasdim, uh, at the, at, towards the end of the first temple period and during the time of the Babylonian exile. So indeed, we've already seen two opinions that try to situate Eov either toward the end of the first temple period or during the time of the Babylonian exile. Some other sages say that Eov lived during the time of the patriarch Jacob, Yaakov Avinu, and that in fact he married Dina, the daughter of Yaakov. Okay. Then the Talmud summarizes and says, 
that amongst all these various opinions, all, all the previous Tanaim agree that Eov was from Israel, meaning that he was Jewish, except of course those who say that he lived during the time of Jacob, because obviously during the time of Jacob, only Jacob and his sons were Jewish. Okay. And then the opinion I alluded to previously, a certain rabbi was sitting before Rabbi Samuel ben Nachmani, and the course of his exposition, he remarked, Eov lo haya v'lo nivra, ela mashal haya. That Eov, in fact, was never an historical figure, but a mashal, a typical figure or a literary figure. And then, of course, the rabbi challenged this student by saying, hold on a minute. The text tells us where he lived. The text tells us his name. So if the text is telling us where he lived and what his name was, doesn't that seem to imply that he was an historical figure and not a typical figure, not a literary figure? To which the student answered, wait a second. Don't tell me that there are no typical figures in the Bible. What about the rebuke that the prophet Nathan gave David when he took uh, Bathsheba to be his wife, and he rebuked him in the form of a parable. He says, there was a man and he had two sheep. So that's a parable, that's a, a typical story. So couldn't the story of Job also be a parable? To which the rabbi got in the last word and he said, if so, then why are his name and the name of his town mentioned? That there seemed to have been a, a, a the opinion of, the, of many of the rabbis that uh, once the, the biblical text provides a wealth of detail about something, that seems to be an indication that it is considering this to be a real historical subject, that otherwise it would not, as it were, waste right, time providing those details. So that, as I said, raises the question. It raises, oh, by the way, so simply in, in support of the opinion, the first opinion mentioned in the Talmud, that Eov uh, lived during the time of Moses, a Talmudic passage in Masechet Sota, referring to the counselors with whom Pharaoh consulted before he decided how to treat the Hebrews, it says, Shlosha hayu ba'ota etza that there were three counselors whom Pharaoh consulted, Bilaam, whom we'll get to in a moment, Eov, and Yitro. And according to the Talmud, they each gave him a very different piece of advice. Bilaam's advice was that he should persecute the Jews. And therefore, his, the consequences of his advice were Neherag, that eventually the Israelites slew Bilaam. Eov, according to this legend, um, gave no advice, okay? Um, he abstained. And therefore, the consequence of his abstention was Nidon bi Yisurim. He was, um, he was uh, condemned to suffer. Why? He didn't say anything bad, but on the other hand, he didn't say anything good. Yitro, Jethro, advised Pharaoh to treat the Hebrews well, right? And how did he do that? Shebarach, he just simply left, okay? And therefore the consequences to him were that his descendants became Torah scholars. And just because I was looking for this passage in the Talmud, so I put the, the, the few of the key words into Google, and strangely enough, it came up with a Jerusalem Post article from not too long ago, February 2017, called Bilam, Job, and Jethro. This is a uh, fascinating little cartoon that accompanied it. Right? You can see that, that, that as he were, uh, I don't know which of the characters it is, is standing there and wondering which of the different situations in the background he should advise. And it relates the substance of the passage we just saw, namely that Bilam advised the king to kill Jewish babies, Job remained silent, and Jethro responded by fleeing from Egypt. 
So this at least supports the idea that Eov was contemporary with Moshe. But as I said uh, earlier, so that works out fine according to whoever says that Eov lived either at the same time as Moses or that Eov might even have lived before Moses. Either way, Eov, an historical character, could have come to Moses' attention. The question is, since we do not assume that Moses could have written the book of Eov if Eov lived during the end of the first temple period or during the time of the Babylonian exile, then if Eov, as an historical figure, lived during the time of the destruction of the first temple and during the time of the Babylonian exile, then who was the author of the book of Eov? And I have found no discussion of this in the literature. That doesn't mean that there was none. It only means that I haven't come across one. So I came up with one of my own. And it's based on the fact that there is only one other reference to Eov in the entire Bible. And the only other reference to Eov in the entire Bible is in the book of the prophet Yechezkel. In the uh, Fourteenth chapter of the book of Yechezkel, he is given an instruction by God. God says to him, should a country sin and trespass against me, I will reach my arm out against her and break her staff of bread, which is a rather poetic way of saying that he'll cause a famine, okay? I shall cause a famine therein and destroy man and beast. And then God says, and curiously, this is chapter 14 in the book of Yechezkel, and it's verse 14 in chapter 14. God says, even if these three men were within her, meaning if within this country that is sinning against God, there were three men, right? Noach, Daniel, and Eov, right? Then God says, Hema v'tzid katam, these three men, because they were personally righteous, yinatzalun nafsham, they will be able to save their own lives, but the implication is, they will not be able to spread, as it were, their merit over others. So this is the only other reference in the Bible to Eov, and it clearly recognizes him as a righteous man. So I asked myself, if the only other reference in the Bible to, the, to Eov is in the book of the prophet Yechezkel, then could the prophet Yechezkel have been the author of the book of Eov? And simply to compress a rather long argument uh, into a shorter one, my, uh, my theory is that, um, that Eov in this book is treated as a personification of the Jewish people. And therefore, the tribulations and the sufferings of Eov are to be seen as the tribulations and suffering of the Jewish people. In a word, I think that the prophet Yechezkel may have written the book of Eov as the equivalent of what we today would call Holocaust theology. That is, the prophet Yechezkel, who was a contemporary with the destruction of the first temple, the uh, exile of Jews to Babylonia, and he lived among the exiles in Babylonia, was probably challenged by his co-religionists to justify the destruction of the temple and the 
and the subsequent exile. So he delivered this, this philosophical or theological argument to them in the form of a, uh, of a literary device featuring a possibly historical, but just as likely a literary figure named Eov, who is stipulated at the outset of the book to be a righteous God-fearing man. And therefore the question arises, how do you justify the suffering of the righteous? The question that, that theologians and philosophers call theodicy, the question of challenging God's justice. So Eov's friends challenge God, challenge Eov, and then God himself comes and speaks to Eov. And in essence, as I said, what it may very well have been was an attempt on the part of the prophet Yechezkel to give his contemporaries something to think about when they themselves were wondering how all of this misfortune could have befallen them. This brings us to the balance of that statement that says that Moses was also the author of something called Parashat Bilaam. Now, the word parasha nowadays means a weekly Torah reading. Technically, it means a Torah paragraph. So either way, whether this is a reference to only a single Torah paragraph or whether in fact it is a reference to a larger segment of the Torah that we call a parasha, the question is simple. Since the statement started out by saying Moses wrote his book, then surely the portion of Bilam, however large or small it might be, is a part of Moses' book. And therefore, if you've already told me that Moses was the author of the book that bears his name, why do you then have to tell me he was also the author of a portion of the book that bears his name? So again, there is some discussion of this, uh, but I thought rather that since this is a, a Talmudic statement, I would treat it with a Talmudic hermeneutic, a, a Talmudic um, uh, means of biblical interpretation. There are uh, 13 hermeneutical rules that guide the, uh, the interpretation of the Torah by the rabbis. Uh, they are the Shlosh Esrei Midot that are attributed to Rabbi Yishmael, and they're well known to anyone who gets to Shur early enough in the morning. Uh, the, uh, to, it's the concluding paragraph in what we call Birchot HaShachar. And amongst these 13 principles is the one you see on the screen in front of you now, Kol davar shahaya bichlal, anything that was part of a general proposition. Viatsa min haklal, and then it was singled out or accepted from that general proposition. Lulamed, and we presume that it was singled out or accepted for a didactic purpose, to teach us something. What does it come to teach us? Lulamed al atzmo It isn't accepted from the rule in order to teach us something particular about this exception, Ella rather, it was accepted from the rule in order to teach us something about the whole rule, which would mean in our case that the reason that the rabbi said that Moses wrote the portion of Bilam was not so much to teach us something about the portion of Bilam in particular, but actually to teach us something about what it means that Moses wrote his own book. And what I believe it does is it gives us an insight into another one of Maimonides' 13 articles of faith. Last week, if you recall, we looked at the one that requires us to believe that the Torah that we have in our possession today is the same one that was given to Moses. This one, which is actually the previous one going in, the, in sequence, is the one that requires us to believe in a perfect faith, that Moses' prophecy was true. 
and here's the major one, v'shehu haya av l'neviyim, that he was the father of all prophets. L'kodemim l'fanav, not to mean that he was the first prophet, because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were also prophets, but somehow Moses was above them. That's the sense here of av l'neviyim. Doesn't mean that he was the father of all prophets in the sense of the first one, but it means that he was the greatest of all prophets. So that Moses' prophecy was, according to Maimonides, we have to regard it as having been singular. And the question, of course, is what was its singularity? And this is a passage from the uh, 15th, 16th century philosopher, exegete, Don Isaac Abrabenel. And he tells us, he tries to describe for us the manner of the singularity of Moses' prophecy. And he says that other prophets did not prophesy in the same manner as Moshe Rabbeinu Alav HaShalom. For he, Moses, would prophetically receive from God not only the subject of his prophecy, meaning not only an inspiration of ideas, but figures and words as well. That is to say, as we already discussed last week, that God gave Moses dictation. God didn't only tell, say to Moses, Moses, tell the Jews to keep Shabbat. God said to Moses, tell the Jews, Zachor et yom Shabbat lekad show, honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy, etc. Just as he would hear them, just as the words, as God would recite the words to him, so would he write them verbatim, ba'otam hamilot, verbatim in the Torah scroll. That's Moses. Other prophets, however, would see in their prophecies only the general outlines of the subjects that God transmitted to them. And they would recite and record them in their own words. So according to Abrabinel, and this is really just an, an expansion on Maimonides, the singularity of the prophecy of Moses was that Moses took dictation and other prophets did not. If you stop for a moment to think about it, that's counterintuitive. If I were addressing a class of students and I were to say to the students, tell me students, I wanna describe two situations. See, I want you to tell me which of the two situations you think is superior. One situation is God comes to somebody and says, you know, if you weren't to cut above the rest, I wouldn't be talking to you in the first place. So please take what I'm going to say in the context in which I'm saying it, okay? I want you to get, deliver this message to the people. So please take out a pen and paper and write it down word for word. That's the first scenario. Second one is God comes to a person, gives them a pat on the back and says, you and me will like this. I want the people to hear a message about whatever it happens to be. I trust you implicitly. Go and deliver the message to them. If I were to formulate it that way and ask students which of these two prophets is superior to the other, I think it's unquestionable that the majority, if not unanimously, they would say that the second scenario was superior. Because here God is entrusting the prophet not only with a mission to deliver a message, but he's trusting the prophet to deliver the message in the best possible way as opposed to the first scenario in which God is saying to the prophet, let's you know, make sure that there are no mistakes, that there are no misunderstandings, just write everything down the way I'm dictating it to you. So if I put it that way, it would seem that the prophecy of Moses would be inferior to the other prophets rather than superior to it. So the question is, how do I turn this around? How do I turn the fact that Moses took dictation to be advantageous rather than disadvantageous. You see, just in case you want to go over the slides later, it's all spelled out here. And my answer is because to take dictation requires a certain sublimation of the ego that only Moses of all people who ever lived was capable. That is to say, if you're going to sit there and write down only the words that God dictates to you and recite to the people only those words that he dictated, 
There can't be any chance, any danger of a slip up of anything going in. Like just simply, I understand what he means. I, what he means is this, that can't happen. Therefore, the person taking dictation has to have such control over his own self that he's prepared to sublimate his own will and his own personality entirely to the will of God. And my argument is that the Torah tells us that the only person who was able to do that was Moses. As it says, Ba'ish Moshe anav ma'od mikol adama shal pneha adama that Moses, the man who was truly modest, humble, self-effacing, more so than any human being on the face of the earth. Therefore, other prophets could not be relied upon to refrain from adulterating the divine message with their own idiosyncratic personalities. Therefore, God spared them that dictation, and rather than giving them dictation, he left them up to their own literary designs. What does any of this have to do with the portion of Gilam? It's very simple. Everything in the Torah to which Moses was not a witness or a participant himself occurred before Moses, that is to say the book of Genesis, the book of Breshit, and surely Moses could have known about that through either oral traditions that existed amongst the Jewish people, or according to at least one Midrashic source, the book of Breshit existed before Moses. So I understand that for a subject that Moses witnessed himself, would I think that Moses needed God to tell him what happened? When Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, didn't Moses know what he had said? Didn't Moses know what Pharaoh had said to him? When Moses sent Joshua and Caleb and the other spies to the land of Israel and they came back and reported to him, right? Did Moses need God to tell him what the spies reported? No. Therefore, I might imagine that when it came to describe things that happened in Moses' own lifetime, when it came time to describe, to write in the Torah about things that Moses himself witnessed or things to which Moses was a participant, Moses might not have needed divine dictation. Moses might not have needed divine inspiration. However, the one portion in the Torah that I know for an absolute fact that Moses could not have known about it personally because no Israelite could have witnessed it was the story of Bilam. Because what transpired between Bilam and Balak, the the pact that they made between them for him, for Bilam to curse Israel and the curses that Bilam recited, there were no Israelites present at any of that. And therefore, the only way that Moses could have known anything about the story of Bilam is if it had been revealed to him prophetically by God. Therefore, going back to the hermeneutic rule that something that is accepted from a general proposition is so not only to teach us about itself, but to teach us about the entire rule, then I would say that just as Moses needed to rely upon prophecy and divine dictation in order to write the story of Bilam, so it was that even when it came to writing about things that he had witnessed himself, Moses did not write about them until he, until he was informed of them prophetically. And when he wrote about them, he wrote about them only in those words that God had dictated to him. And with that, we can move on to Joshua. So Joshua, according to the Talmud, wrote his book, and eight verses in the Torah, and we spoke about that last week, and you'll pardon the typographical error, I left out the S in verses. Okay, so the Talmud asks the following question. You say, right, you posit that Joshua wrote his book, but isn't there a verse at the very end of the book of Joshua, and I'll show it to you here, that says, right, um, 
Vayamot Yehoshua Benon, that Joshua died? So arguably, if Joshua died, he couldn't have written. If we said that Joshua had to have written about Moses' death, then somebody else had to have written about Joshua's death. Okay, says the Talmud, you win. The book of Joshua was completed by Eliezer. Eliezer, the son of Aharon, the Kohen. Ah, comes back the student and says to his teacher, but it is also written that the book of Joshua that Eliezer, the son of Aharon, died. So somebody else had to have described his death. Okay, said the rabbi, you win again. The book was completed by Pinchas, the son of Elazar HaKohen. Now, the interesting thing here is the passage that I highlighted at the end of the book of Joshua. It does say that, um, it does mention the death of Elazar after the death of Joshua, but it's also a reference here. It says that Israel continued to serve God throughout the entire lifetime of Joshua, v'chol yemei hazikenim, and during the lifetimes of all of the elders, asher he'erichu yamim acharei Yehoshua, the elders who outlived Joshua. Now that's an interesting question. Who are these elders? So for this, I refer us to the opening Mishnah in the Tractate of Avot, the Mishnah that describes what has come to be known as the Masoret or the Shalshelat HaKabalah, the chain of tradition. Moses received the Torah from God at Sinai and he delivered it to Joshua. To whom did Joshua deliver the Torah? Joshua delivered the Torah to the Zikanim. Those are the Zikanim, the elders, who are mentioned in that verse we saw at the end of the book of Joshua. The elders, the Zikanim, they passed the Torah along to the Nevi'im, to the prophets. Now, Moses was already a prophet. Arguably, Joshua was a prophet, okay? Which prophets are they talking about? So, arguably, they're talking about Samuel, the prophet Samuel. So, the Zikanim are the link between the era of Joshua and the era of Samuel. Some of these Zikanim are probably one and the same with the figures who are referred to in the book following Joshua as the Shofetim, the judges. But that would take us into the next subject, which is the prophet Shmuel, who is regarded to have been the author, not only of the book that bears his name, but also the author of the book of Judges. And we'll pick up with that next week. So let me just pause here and see what the chat has brought us. Okay, let me go back to the beginning if I can. Okay. Yeah, when we get to when we get to, to in, in the sequence that we're going, when we get to the um, to Chizkiyahu and his entourage, and it says that they wrote those books that are usually credited to uh, to King Solomon, we will discuss this point. Uh, in greater detail. Okay. Uh, I don't know what this is. A script ion is traditional. I, I don't know who, if somebody wants to add something to this. Somebody, whoever wrote this, wants to tell me what, maybe there's something in the typing that went bad. I, I don't know what what it's referring to. Sorry. Okay. Some of the Talmud of Subjun was an Israelite and some that he was a non-Israelite. Exactly. Okay. Spies timeline suggests that he was a non-Israelite because clearly he was living in the land of Canaan at the time that all of the Jews were still in the wilderness. Okay. Um, uh, I have a special affinity for and relationship with the book of Job. I, 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 often, I often find myself lecturing on the book of Job. I think it's more because a lot of other people are scared away by it. 
um, more so than my having a, a particular affinity for it, but yes, I, I, I do. Um, yeah, um, it's a curious thing. Maybe we'll talk about that too one day. Um, the name that appears in, in Ezekiel 14, 14 is Daniel, right? With a chirik under the nun and a tzere under the aleph, Daniel. While the hero of the biblical book of a similar name is Daniel with a yud, Daniel. Now, the, the two are, are similar enough. Um, we find Chizkiya and Chizkiyahu. We find Yeshaya and Yeshayahu. So to make a big deal about the difference between Daniel and Daniel, maybe, you know, making a mountain out of a molehill. On the other hand, there is a character, Daniel, not in the Bible, but in ancient Near Eastern literature. He's a character in Ugaritic mythology. Ugarit was a city in north of the land of Israel in the territory that, uh, that is known uh, historically as Phoenicia. It was one of the Phoenician city-states. And the curious thing is that if you look in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse one, and you see to whom the chapter was addressed, it's addressed to the prince of Tyre, Sor, another one of the Phoenician city-states. So what it seems to be that when the prophet Yechezkel is talking to the non-Jews living in Phoenicia, he doesn't mention three Jewish righteous men, he deliberately mentions three non-Jewish righteous men, Noah, Daniel, and Eov three non-Jewish righteous men, all figures from hoary antiquity. Okay. Yes, Rabbi Kelman was kind enough to give you the link to one of my, uh, one of my presentations on Eov. Okay, going on. Um, Yes, the claim, the claim wasn't, the, the claim, in fact, was precisely that. It's, it's to say that, 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 that wickedness was so widespread that ordinarily, look, let's look at last week's Torah reading for a brief moment, okay? Um, when Abraham is negotiating with God over the fate of the city of Sodom, okay, God essentially says to Abraham that if there were 10 righteous people in the city of Sodom, they wouldn't only be spared personally, but that God would spare the whole city on their account. So there is an, a, an idea that a righteous person has a righteous person can have sufficient merit, that he can share some of his merit with other people. What the prophet Yechezkel was instructed to say was that there was so much wickedness and so little merit that whatever merit existed would not be able to spare other people. Don't know about the difference. Don't know. Find the book of Job and 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 it's look. Uh, since I can't prove anything because there are no other. There, are, there is no documentary evidence concerning it. Uh, it it's certainly a possibility. I, I'll have to give some thought to it. Yes, Don Jewish figure, whoever wrote this, was anticipating what I said about Noah and, and, and Don El and Eo. Absolutely. Okay. Um, dictation being more accurate, yes. That's another way to explain um, those two strange scenarios, the counterintuitive scenarios. And that is that if, you're, if you want to send people a message, happy birthday, okay, um, or uh, have a, a happy Thanksgiving, the particular words don't matter so much. Right, as long as they as long as they deliver a message of, of good feeling, of good cheer, of celebration, doesn't matter whether you say happy Thanksgiving, Merry Thanksgiving, a big deal. On the other hand, if you have to give somebody directions and you want to tell them how to get someplace, you can't say when you get to the corner of Oak and and, and Pine Street, um, turn. You know, that's not helpful because you have to know which way to turn. So another way to explain the same counterintuitive scenario is to say that it's not a function 
of the writer, but it's a function of what is written. And because the Torah is a book of directions, a book of instructions, it has to be more precise. And therefore, it has to be dictated to make sure that it has that element of precision in it. Okay. Um, I may not have run out of time, but I think I've run out of voice. So I have to apologize to whoever has something on the chat that I'm just not going to be able to get to this evening. I, I will look it over. And if there's something that's, uh, that needs to be followed up on, I, I will pick up on it next week. Shmuel, you can pick up next week. What about uh, like Shmuel dying in the middle of his book? Okay, well, we'll have to get you a bigger water bottle. But uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, tomorrow morning, 12 p.m. I mistakenly announced 11 earlier this week, 12 p.m. Uh, Shuli Mishkin continue her series of back from her, her son's wedding. Actually, it's the middle of Shabbat breakfast, but uh, she'll be, be giving the class tomorrow. Um, Karaites and their opponents, that's tomorrow at 12. Tomorrow night's Parsha Shear, 8.30, is being given by Rifki Freundlich. From, um, from Montreal, her husband, uh, to her and her husband are sort of the, the rabbinic team at the Tiferet Bet David Jerusalem, TBDJ, uh, Big Shul in Montreal. And um, Friday morning, of course, I'll be giving my shir on the Siddur at 9.30 a.m. And Sunday, Rabbi Liebtag, and uh, Monday, uh, Dr. Guhart and Mark Shapiro, and Tuesday, uh, Rachel, Rachel Danziger, and Wednesday, Ruff Carmel, and then back to Dr. Sokolow next week. So we've gone through um, Moshe, the, the Chamisha Chum Shetor Eov and Yoshua. So seven down and 17 to go, if we can say that, no? And, um, okay. Everybody be well, Lila Tov. Please invite your friends. That's your, I tell you all the time. Uh, I don't know. You have to, I'm going to have to start taking attendance like that. Uh, who, you know, that's the admission cost. Uh, they invite a friend to come to join us. And we look forward to learning with you and everybody be well. Have a wonderful night and week. And we look forward to seeing you soon and to hearing your comments. Thank you very much. Lila Tov, everybody. Is the Good night. Thank is you. there also the one on Tanakh, the translation? I'm sorry, Debbie, what are you asking? The one, the class on translation also. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, I mentioned that. That's Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Guhart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's oh, Monday so, at right. 11. Right. As I mentioned at the beginning of the class, I'll mention again, next Wednesday and Thursday, not Monday and Tuesday, next Wednesday and Thursday, Rev Carmel's class will be at 2.15 and Shuli Mission's class will be at 1 p.m. just for one week while the clocks between Israel and North America are off by an hour or whatever you want to call it. So where um, the, the Wednesday, Thursday class next week, we'll send that by email. We'll be an hour later for those living on the East Coast. Uh, and except, you know, okay. And then once we change the clock next Saturday night, we'll, uh, we'll be back to uh, our regular time. So two classes next week will be impacted by that. Yeah, but that, that'll be Monday. Okay, everybody. Lila Tov, if anybody was upset they didn't get to play Jewish geography at the beginning, you can always play now. We can, we can stay on and play if you missed the discussion earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Lila Tov, everybody. Lila Tov.